in recent time, the U.S. has made several advancements in space exploration, from landing on the moon and planting the U.S. flag on its surface, to self-landing stage one thrusters, and now, a journey to transport a team of astronauts to Mars. Over the course of these events, our knowledge about space and the universe as a whole has grown immensely, but in order to understand the full journey of space exploration, we have to look back to one man who overcame this challenge in 1962. John Glenn, the first man to orbit the Earth in one of the first major jumps in crossing the frontier of space exploration. John Glenn was born in Cambridge, Ohio on July 18, 1921. Glenn studied engineering in a Muskingum College in New Concord. John Glenn did not finish his senior year, however, because of the Second World War. Rather than finishing school, he chose to become a fighter pilot being that he was already a licensed aviator. By the time of the Second World War ended, Glenn had flown in 149 missions and shot down three Soviet fighters. John Glenn had interest in spaceflight and even volunteered to serve in simulators that were made to test G-forces in 1958. Glenn came close to not getting recruited, however, due to his age and lack of a bachelor's degree. But even with this being the case, he would go on to earn a position as one of the Mercury 7. As many people know, John F. Kennedy, the former president of the United States, was known for pushing space exploration in the 1960s. At the time that the space race started, JFK had not even been inaugurated yet. In December of 1960, the U.S. Air Force sent a letter to NASA explaining that the president-elect had to understand the importance of military supremacy in space. This would then mean that the Air Force would have to be granted the primary role. The Air Force even leaked their message to the president to solidify their point to Kennedy. This was not just a simple battle between countries. The very purpose of for creating the U.S. space program was on the line. In 1961, JFK announced his ambitious goal of landing on the moon. In order to overcome this, they would have to solidify their spot in the space race. To do this, they would need a group of brave men to rise to the occasion. At the time, many people believed that this goal was unachievable. Most of the science and math behind this mission was still unknown. There were numerous achievements that the Soviets had over the U.S., but JFK wouldn't let that stop the U.S. from achieving their goal. Project Mercury was America's first space program and was established in 1958. The program had three main goals, orbiting a manned spacecraft, investigating a man's ability to function in space, and safely recovering both the spacecraft and the crew member. John Glenn's Friendship 7 flight would take 40,000 collaborators to complete this mission. Some of these people consisted of private contractors, which made components to personnel at remote tracking stations, and sailors that had to be on standby to recover Glenn at Splashdown. With that being said, John Glenn was still the man who held all the risk. He would be leaving his wife and two children behind as he flew into orbit. This image shows Glenn squeezing inside the capsule assisted by his patch crew. Glenn had spent nearly four hours in the capsule before the launch, but at 9.47 a.m., the three main engines ignited. February 20th, 1962. The Friendship 7 capsule takes off. Before Glenn had even launched into orbit, he understood the importance of capturing photos of Earth for the world to see. He asked special permission to bring a camera on board the Friendship 7. On his first orbit, John Glenn took pictures of the Earth and explained how beautiful of a sight it was from above. Three orbits around the Earth was the primary objective of NASA's Project Mercury. The reasoning for shooting for three orbits was simple. After three orbits, it's still possible to land in the Atlantic Ocean for recovery near the Cape Canaveral launch site. Because the Earth is constantly rotating, the fourth and further orbits are less convenient. If a spacecraft landed after a greater amount of orbits, it could possibly land in the mountains of, or jungles of South America. As John Glenn went to his second orbit, something goes wrong.
controllers received the signal that the spacecraft's landing bag, which was used to cushion the impact at splashdown, had been deployed. This meant that the heat shield that used for re-entry was no longer in place. Engineers came up with a plan to keep the retro rocket pack, which contained retro rockets to slow the shuttle's speed for landing, on after retrofire. The engineers hoped that the straps would hold the heat shield in place. Glenn wasn't informed about the specifics on the situation, but was advised by all ground stations to make sure the landing bag deploy switch was off. Besides that one issue, Glenn's second orbit around the Earth passed by smoothly. John Glenn would then start his third and final orbit over Hawaii. Nearing the California coastline, the spacecraft fired its three retro rockets to slow its velocity. Engineers at ground stations monitored the Friendship 7's re-entry into Earth's orbit. Glenn described the re-entry as a real fireball outside. As the capsule was moving through Earth's atmosphere, the retro pack burned off and flew by his window. Glenn manually controlled the spacecraft's attitude, or the orientation of the spacecraft, draining the vessel's fuel supply as he's entering Earth. At 28,000 feet, the parachute was deployed. The destroyer USS Noah recovered John Glenn from the castle and returned him to safety. Here we can see John Glenn join President Kennedy in a parade along Cocoa Beach, celebrating his massive achievement. President Kennedy also presented John Glenn with the NASA Distinguished Service Medal. Glenn and his wife attended many parades and celebrations for his incredible achievement. Thousands of people came to see Glenn from across the US. This not only showed him, but the whole country how great of an accomplishment this was and how he was able to bring the people of the U.S. closer together. On February 23, 1963, NASA turned the capsule, along with Glenn's spacesuit, over to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. It is now on display at the Stephen F. Udverhazy Center of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Chantilly, Virginia. Just like that, the United States were headed in the right direction and overcame the frontier of solidifying themselves in the space race. As many know, Glenn's achievement would lead to many greater things in the future. In terms of what was next for the U.S., they'd already orbited a manned spacecraft, they investigated a man's ability to function in space, and safely recovered both the spacecraft and crew member. The next step would be to get a team of astronauts on the moon and plant the U.S. flag on its surface. Fortunately for the U.S., they would do just that.